So, brothers and sisters, before we begin this prestigious interview uh, for the first time in my life with my dear brother, uh, Ustaz Nu'man Ali Khan, we have to start with a dua, insha'Allah, for our brothers and sisters in Gaza, in Palestine. Uh, so, please say Amin. I'll just say it in Arabic. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alamin, wa salatu wa salamu ala Rasulihi al Karim. Allahumma inna nas'aluka bi asma'ika al husna wa sifatika al ula. أن تحفظ إخواننا في غزة في فلسطين اللهم أبدل خوفهم أمنا اللهم أخرجهم من كل اللهم اجعل لهم من كل ضيق فرجا اللهم اجعل موتاهم من الشهداء ومن الذين قلت فيهم ولا تحسبن الذين قتلوا في سبيل الله أمواتا بل أحياء عند ربهم يرزقون اللهم ارحم موتاهم اللهم واجعل أولادهم فرطا وذخرا لهم عند حوض نبيك صلى الله عليه وسلم وعند أبواب الجنة في الذين قلت فيهم والذين صبروا ابتغاء رضوان ربهم رضوان ربهم وأقاموا الصلاة وآتوا الزكاة وأمروا بالمعروف ونهوا عن المنكر ثم قلت فيهم أنهم يدخلون جناتك ويدخلون عليهم الملائكة من كل باب ويسلمون عليهم اللهم اجعلهم وإيانا منهم يا رب العالمين اللهم رد المسلمين إلى دينك مردا جميلا اللهم اجمع شملهم اللهم واغفر لنا ولهم اللهم ولا تؤاخذنا بما فعل السفهاء منهم اللهم احفظنا جميعا وتقبل منا يا رب العالمين ومنهم وصلى الله على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين My dear brother Ustaz Norman Ali Khan, it is a pleasure, an absolute pleasure, to meet with you. Uh, we all know who Ustaz Norman Ali Khan is. I'm actually going to uh, get to know you, inshallah, in this evening and have the pleasure of sharing your experience and your journey together from what you were and how you became. And if you don't mind, I'd like to begin by talking about the first time that I ever saw you. Okay. And the first time I saw you was probably in 2010 or 2011. It was online when YouTube was still, I think we had passed the, the, the internet stage where it was a dial-up network. Right. And then uh, you were on YouTube, I think, with The Dean Show. Oh, the, the Dean, Dean Show. Brother Ali, yeah. You looked yeah. a little bit different, a little bit younger. Yes. It seems like, mashallah, as you get older, you get more handsome, tabarakallah. But very as kind of you, Jazakallah. Not true, but okay, yes. <laughs> this is all in a brotherly way. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So he was interviewing you, and for the first time it said, an atheist becomes a Muslim. Yeah. And I wanted to see who this person is because, as a teacher myself, we had young people, and also in the West, they kind of question sometimes uh, how do I know that Allah exists? How do I know that Islam is the right way? Some of them are afraid of asking that question. I was very intrigued by that, by that interview. When I heard you speak, you weren't yet, alhamdulillah, in, yani, as Allah SWT has blessed you, in the fame that you have, and of course in a good way, inshallah, and in your da'wah. And I was, I was listening very carefully. And I okay. said to myself, this young man here, he's actually eloquent. He speaks very well. And I can't believe he's just a random atheist who became a Muslim, and I'm not going to say too much, but if I'm right about that, can you please share with us this little journey? Were you an atheist? Were you a Muslim before that? And then you became like that? Were there questions? Were there doubts? What brought you into Islam? So, um, Jazakallah for your question. Um, I think, well, obviously I was raised in a Muslim family, and um, I, fairly practicing Muslim family, I'd say. Um, and my childhood was in Saudiya, actually, a part of it. So from the second grade to the eighth grade, my dad, who f served in the Pakistan embassy, was stationed in Riyadh. So we, I, we, was, we were in Riyadh. We went to many Umrahs together. My dad did two Hajj there. Well, we didn't go to Hajj. The kids didn't go. But um, And then we, I, I had a little bit of schooling in Pakistan also for about less than a year. So my early education was basically all in... The, an Islamic environment. And then when we came to the US, uh, I was ready to go into 10th grade, and uh, we signed up for public school. And public school in Queens, New York, is basically the kind of chaos you see at a bus station 
in the Muslim world. Like it's, it doesn't look like a classroom. It was absolute pandemonium. And it was, a, it was the massive, massive culture shock for me. Um, just to get to the point about this atheism thing, I think the first thing, if I look at myself intros introspectively and kind of think about how I was transitioning, the first thing I felt was out of place. Like I don't belong here. These people make fun of the way I speak. They think I'm strange, I'm weird, I'm awkward. They're more confident than I am. They're better spoken than I am. Like they're, they're just better at everything than I am. I just felt inadequate and inferior in every way when I was at school. And it, it, it was a very common part of the culture to make fun of people publicly and humiliate them. And, and kids can be cruel, but I, you know, there's, it's interesting. Uniform does something. When you're wearing uniform, you're not dressed any better than anybody else. So what are they going to make fun of? Your shoes aren't as shiny? Like, there's nothing to pick on. But when, you're, when you don't have uniforms in schools, which we don't have in the US, uh, you have people wearing brand clothes, people dressed this way or that way. And obviously, I just came from Pakistan. So I'm going to dress like a nerdy Pakistani kid. I mean, I, I took what, a, what, what did you dress like, exactly? A sweater knit by my mom. Okay. Does that help? Yeah, that paints a pretty good picture. I can relate. I, <laughs> yeah. Happened to me, <laughs> okay. same thing. So. My mother sewed my tracksuit pants. <laughs> I'm a laughing stock for one year. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah, and I took a briefcase to school, you know, so that, that, that didn't go well. Uh, <laughs> and um, so being the object of ridicule, the, the, the only thought in my head was surviving the day in school. Like that's the, like I, I could be sitting there in class just thinking who's going to say something next. That was the anxiety I had all day. And it's not something I could talk to my family about. Because that's a different world than when you walk into school, right? And so um, then, then... And this is in primary school you're talking about? This yeah? is high school. High school, Yeah, right. this is high school. This is me. I was uh, about 16 years old now. And um, one of the things I learned then is I better find... You have to... You, have, you can survive only in a pack. So you have to find a pack. And then there are weirdos in every school. You know, the nerds and the... Strange ones that don't fit in of course, everywhere. Yep, so that's <laughs> I, had a, I had a couple of weirdos that were just kind of outliers, and we became friends, right? And that became our little, let's, let's be in the corner, isolated from the rest of society together. You were with the weirdos. Yeah, I was with the weirdos, okay. right? It was a, Congratulations. There was this Russian guy, and there was this like, Chinese kid, and there was me, and there was this, this Sardar kid, and we were just the weirdos in the corner, and that was our hangout. But then, over time, a new impulse uh, kicked in, and that was, no, 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 I don't just want to be in the corner, I want to fit in. What does it take to fit in, right? And then wanting to talk like the others, the first, I think the first jump in my English vocabulary came with foul language. Because that was, I don't know if that's the case here, but in New York, uh, a, a, a cuss word, a filthy word, is a noun, an adjective, an adverb, uh, <laughs> a comma, and a full stop. So it's every other word is a foul word to communicate a sentence. So if you're going to pick up the lingo, that's what you have to pick up, right? And it's interesting. Allah says, It actually has an effect on you spiritually when you start using foul language. And you become less and less in tune with your own fitra. It's, it's, it's khilaf al-fitra. I, actually, I, I felt that way. And um, Khilaf al-fitra means... Like it goes against your nature. Because there's a human nature to not want to use those words. Your tongue isn't designed. Your tongue was designed to say sacred things, beautiful things. Like it goes. It's it violates something inside you. And I could feel it, but it was just the social desire to fit in. Then the way I dress changed. The way I got my haircut changed. I had a weird haircut. I had one of those like shaved all sides and a ponytail situation. Yep. And then I, I got a job in a a Spanish neighborhood. So. I, my English got pretty good, but then I, I, I started learning Spanish to fit in the Spanish neighborhood. So my Spanish got really, really good. People thought I was Mexican or Puerto Rican or like, you know, so. Um, but then the, this, the atheism thing actually came, I, I like to think of atheism as two. It's a, there's a psychological atheism and there's, a, there's an intellectual atheism. And I don't think I was ever an intellectual atheist, actually. That, that's, the intellectual atheism is actually, for most people, I think, is just an excuse. It's 90% of that iceberg is psychological. Uh, I agree, 100%. You know? Yeah, that's right. And then the, they just top it off with some intellectual excuses and rationales. And then the moment you start chipping away at those really weak rational arguments, 
then the emotional side just comes out roaring. And you're like, okay, that's what's really going on with you. And that's what was going on with me, right? And so I didn't see the need for this religion. And if you don't need religion, why do you need God? Like everything I need is, I have my friends, you can have popularity, you can have whatever you want, you need a job, you need money in life. These are the things you need. Why do you need to go pray? Why do you need to do all, you know, so that stuff became more and more irrelevant. And then the, the tip of the iceberg was first semester of college, I took philosophy 101. And it was two courses I took, philosophy of ethics and philosophy, metaphysics. So in, in metaphysics, it's... Sorry, Stas Norman, so college is at university? It's uh, So 12th grade is high school. Right. And then, then, then right after that, you start college. College, yeah. so like university? Basically, yes. Okay. Yeah, we, we, in America, we kind of use it interchangeably oh, okay. a little bit. Sorry if other people know, I just yeah. am very in tune. It's all good. Um, so what happened in philosophy class, I loved it. I loved Plato, Aristotle. I loved, like, I just, I really got into logic and, you know, um, uh, even religious philosophies and things like that. And then the arguments for the teleological, cosmological, ontological arguments for the existence of God and their the counter arguments against them. I was fascinated with that stuff. And at the end of it, I was like, you know what? Every, for every logical argument, there's a logical counter argument for the existence of God. So this is a stalemate. So you get to choose. That's kind of where my professor sort of left it. And then to add to that, I was taking another course called uh, Philosophy of Ethics. And uh, the, to summarize it, the point of the Philosophy of Ethics course is there is no such thing as right and wrong. It's just whatever you feel. So your is the final conclusion to that, you know? And that's really comforting for someone who doesn't want to uh, surrender themselves. Because now I'm the other in English. Yeah, so like have you seen someone who takes their their whims and turns them into their god? Right? So you become the god. Why why do you need to have a higher power? you you decide, you know? So um in that sense, it felt artificially liberating to be an atheist. And to, because, you know, I'm in New York, and then my, my parents, they were, my dad got papers um, to go back to Pakistan. And he was going to leave in six months, right? And I was really excited that he's going to leave in six months. And my parents, because I was going to stay back in, in uni. And now I don't have any parents controlling what I'm going to do. I don't have, like, nobody's going to watch over, you know, I'm going to have complete freedom, right? And in New York, of all places. So this is going to be great. <laughs> you know? And then Allah had other plans. And he sort of redirected my, uh, my thoughts and my, my... Actually, first, I think my first transformation wasn't intellectual, it was emotional. Uh, and then my second transformation was intellectual. So it, it worked in reverse order. Any emotional in what sense? Can you explain that? Uh, yeah, so I saw a dream. That was probably the big event. Uh, I saw a dream. I had I had snuck out of the house. My parents were upstairs. I had a in New York. We have basements. You guys have basements here? Yeah. Okay, so we, uh, not too many, but we had, do have. Okay, so, so our home in Queens, we had place. a basement. So my room was in the basement, also because my sister didn't want to be in the basement, and then I get the basement because it gets flooded. So, but I, I was okay with it. So, the advantage of it was it had its own back door exit to out of the house, so I could sneak out of the house from the basement, and nobody would know. So I snuck out of the house, went to this party with my Hindu friend, hung out with him until 3 in the morning, snuck back into the house. Mom, never, dad never found out. Now they're going to watch this video. But anyway, so but they, they, I get back, and uh, I fall asleep, safe and sound. And I see myself in, my dream, in a dream in my own grave. And uh, my head has been turned into a lizard's head and there's fire pouring out from both sides, like multiple faucets just pouring out fire, like water from both sides. And there's, this, there's somebody over the grave saying, this is because you don't pray. And I woke up like that. And by this point, it must have been a couple of years I hadn't prayed anything, no Jum'ah, no Eid, no nothing, right? And this is before my parents left. So now I get up and I, prayed, I don't even know, I, I knew there are five prayers, but I didn't quite remember how they work. So I prayed some version of Isha, followed by some version of Maghrib, followed by some version of, uh, in succession, and 
By, Sorry, so you didn't grow up in a family environment where they taught you how to pray from They did, age, but it, it had been so long since I prayed that ah, I just... Ah, you had forgotten. I've forgotten it. That's it. Yeah. Mm. And so, and then I was in sajda and I started crying. And I kept on crying. And then I fell asleep Is crying. Is this still in the dream? No. No, it's This wasn't real life. So I fell asleep crying. I woke up the next morning in sajda. And something in me just kind of got shaken up. And uh, the first thing I decided to do because I was going to go to you know, meet with my friends the next day. Like, nothing in my outside world has changed. Something crazy has happened inside, but nothing outside is different, right? Uh, my friends are like, hey, you want to go? Go get some pizza? No, I don't want to go. I don't want to do this. I don't want to do this. I start pulling away from all of my social acquaintances, right? And they start noticing. So, you okay? You all right? You know, is everything okay? And then I started... I felt the need to pray, so I started finding corners in the campus in college to Just pray. Says, no, man, why did you feel the need to pull away from them? Why couldn't you just be friends with them and then in your spare time? I think if I'm being super honest, uh, I could sense the darkness from their company. Like ever since that dream, I could, you could almost feel a darkness. Would it be right to say that you feared that if you mix with them again, you're going to lose that yeah. lovely... It was kind of a bittersweet feeling that you had, but there was something. Something. I was actually terrified of losing it. Uh, terrified of I losing. I was terrified it. of losing it. That's probably how I describe it. And uh, so I started kind of pulling away from them, and then Allah just opened other doors for me. I met some people in campus that I became friends with Muslims, and that was a strange story by itself. But uh, the people I met, they were they were good brothers really good brothers, but they weren't preachy. Like, they, they didn't ever make any da'wah to me or anything. And I was, they saw me praying correctly, and they didn't really make a thing out of it, right? And uh, one of them, they, he decided to kind of start giving me a ride, and he took me to other MSAs. So we were in the city school. So this so just MSAs. Was, Muslim Students Association. Yeah, Muslim yeah. School Association. Yeah. So... So we were in the, the, the Muslim club in our college, in Baruch College, and ours was a city school. So the city college or city university, uh, it's cheap. It's like, you know, $1,600 a semester was considered cheap. And, you know, I, I think it's much more now. But just up the road in the city, uptown, was Columbia University, which is like $20,000 a semester, which is now probably 50000 I don't even know how expensive they are now. But they had an MSA. And they were having a meeting. And the guys, my, my friend said, let's go to their meeting. I was like, rich school meeting? Yeah, let's go. Because <laughs> we know that's, that's too rich for my blood. I can get inside there and see what it's like. So we go in there, and there's a circle of brothers and sisters, like a half circle of sisters, half circle of brothers. And they're discussing how they're going to raise enough money. And they have a poster of a child in the middle. Because there was some flood that had happened in Bangladesh. And they had arranged for different children to be adopted by families in, Muslim families in America that were left orphans. And they had identified a child that their MSA was going to help uh, adopt and come up with the funds for his, his, his um, paperwork. And I'm sitting there listening to these people that are... Is this the first experience for you in your life to see something like that? Where people yeah. are actually trying to make projects to help people outside? The yeah. Like, like, first time. It's not just first time to see that it's, these people are my age. Like, everybody I knew until now is, you want to go play basketball, you want to get some pizza, you want to go watch a movie, you want to go do something stupid, like, this, this was life. And did you think at that time that religion was kind of for older people? Only older yeah. people do stuff like that? Yeah. It's still time to In get In fact, to I never even thought about stuff like that. It, it, the, my, my universe wasn't that big. It was a very small world in my head. And then I'm thinking, what makes these people even think like this? Like... What, what's in their food? Like, why are they? they they're so much better. They're, they're, they're much better human beings than I ever thought I could be. What is it about them? Right? And it was my, my friend who took me there, didn't say anything on the way back. He's like, What did you think? I was like, I don't know. They're just, that was weird. I was like, what, what was weird about it? Tell me what was weird. I was like, They're so, these people are so awesome. He goes, Yeah, I know. You want to go somewhere else that's awesome? I was like, okay, yeah. So what he did to me, he did for me, is he introduced me to a masjid in, uh, in Queens, in, in Flushing, in Ramadan. 
He took me to a program because he knew I, sp I, I mean, I had learned English, but my native language is still Urdu, right? So English is my second language, technically my third, but still my second language. Um, and there was a scholar coming from Pakistan who was going to do a daura of the Quran in Ramadan. So they were going to do 20 taraweeh and like four rakah then four rakah of a translation of what we just recited and a an ex brief explanation for an hour, then the next four rakah, then the next four rakah, then the so until 2.30 a.m. We're going to go through all of just the you know, first juz, then the next night second, next night third, 30 nights the entire Qur'an. You took part in that? So he brought me to that. Okay, that's in the deep end. That's on the deep end. I, I, before that I had read maybe a little bit of the Yusuf Ali translation of the Qur'an and I found it extremely difficult uh, and I just put it down. I was like, I, I can't, I'm trying to make sense of this, I can't. So I go to this thing, and he's, the, the teacher, he doesn't know who I am. There's like 50, 60 people in the program. Um, for the people that wanted to make the regular taraweeh, they were on the second floor, and the people that wanted to do this, like crazy, four and four and four with the whole tafsir, mukhtasar, the brief commentary, they were on the third floor. It was a special room for them, because the, the other people just want to do their thing and get out. Right? So they, they had two parallel things going on. So I go up there, I start listening to him talk. For a good hour, he's just explaining this portion of the Quran. And he's just, trans he's mostly, 90% he's translating, maybe 10% of the time he'll throw in a comment here and there, but he's mostly translating. And it, it didn't feel like he was reading a translation, he was speaking a translation. Right? It, did, it sounded like a conversation. And listening to that long enough, it stopped feeling like he's there. It just started feeling to me like Allah is communicating and I'm just hearing Allah say stuff. I'm listening to Allah's words. And it was the most surreal experience. Like it just, Allah is conversing with us? I thought it's a book. I didn't think it was a conversation. You do you know? think that was your inspiration? Absolutely. Because you do that now. Yeah. Do you realize you do that? Yeah. Yeah, that, that was it. So you realize? Yeah, absolutely. Oh, and, I, th and I thought we discovered uh, something. So. All right. I discovered it a little bit earlier. Amazing, amazing. <laughs> but no, it's true because young, it's, it's very familiar what you're talking about to typical uh, Western raised young people. Even in East, I, I was in Lebanon for several years, I studied there. And young people, similar. Yeah. However, your journey is very similar to my journey and the journey of many other young people here in a very similar way. Uh, and uh, that's the idea that back in the days we thought uh, you're, only if you're 40 and over you'll be in the masjid and the Qur'an is just for people at that age yeah. because nobody actually spoke the Qur'an to us in the way that it's supposed to be spoken. It's a speech. Yeah, it's a speech. So you've yeah. got to bring it like Allah is really talking to you. And that's amazing how you said he became absent and it's as if... Allah is yeah, speaking he to just, you. Yeah, he disappeared. He went into the background. Amazing. That was, that's, well, he would, he would be my role model too, Michelle. Yeah, and so he, so I, he, not only was this a surreal experience in a spiritual sense, I still had a lot of psychological baggage, right? right? And the, the, the philosophy of ethics, the, you know, the epistemology stuff, whatever, this was all circling in my head. What he didn't know is as he was going through Baqarah and then Ali Imran, he was untying every one of the philosophical knots that were in my head without me ever approaching him and saying, what do you say about this and what do you say about this? And he wasn't even saying it. He was, it was just the Qur'an saying it. And I'm hearing that and saying, well, that problem just got solved. Oh, well, okay, yeah, well, that, yeah. Hmm. And it, yeah, it's just, he's just unraveling my philosophical knots, one after the other, after the other, after the other. And then the other thing simultaneously that the, that the Qur'an was doing in that conversation, it just started, it, you just felt like someone who really knows you and you can't believe they know you that well and they're talking to you. They're like, who told you, who told you this about me? How do you, how do you know that about me? You know? Can I just, I, I have to, before I forget. Yeah. Because you just reminded me of something amazing. I want to share it with the people. So two things. Um, a lot of people who convert to Islam or revert, whichever word yeah. you want to use, um, I hear the common phrase from them when I talk to them. They say, I thought I was reading the Qur'an, but then I found that the Qur'an reads you. Yeah. It truly does read you and yeah. goes right deep into your soul, doesn't it? you just got to open up to it. Another one, have you heard of Dr. Jeffrey Lang? Of course. Yeah. So you're reminding me of what he was saying in that famous talk of his. 
Uh, he was saying it broke every single argument brick by brick in my mind. Yeah. So because he came from a purely atheistic uh, background. Yeah. So there's there's a similar journey. Now I wanted to highlight that you you made that uh, um, just that, that um, similarity, didn't you? Yeah, I really loved Dr. Jeffrey Lang. Yeah. He's he's incredible. Dr. Jeffrey Lang. Yeah. Yeah. Zachary Nike is another guy. Yeah. Yeah. So like, so after that experience. I was both elated, but I was also really angry. I was really angry because I was maybe 18 years old by then, uh, 18 and a half maybe, and I felt like my entire upbringing in the Muslim world robbed me of the Quran. Like, how come nobody told me Allah talks to you? Yeah. Like I felt gypped, I felt cheated. Wow. Like this is wrong, why, why shouldn't people know this? Like everybody should know this. And it just, it made me so upset that people don't know this, you know? And I, it's at the end of that program that I went to my teacher, the, the, the lecturer, he didn't know who I was. I just went up to him and I said, I want to do what you're doing. I just want to do what you're doing. I want to know what you know. And he goes, okay, easy, learn Arabic. Just, easy, learn Arabic. That's what he said. I was like, okay, how do I learn Arabic? He goes, I'm starting a class next week. <laughs> <laughs> so I started learning Arabic with him the next week. They had that course in, in the masjid. They had the course in the masjid, yeah. Okay, right. And then right. that just became the start of my, my obsession with uh, the Quran, with the Arabic language. Arabic only because it was just... Every time I learned something in Arabic, I wanted to see how does it enhance my understanding of the Quran. And just I kept going back and kept, kept going back, kept going back. And it was... Uh, I was a bad student in university. Like, bees are a good day, right? So I, I had a hard time focusing. I was distracted. <laughs> Did better than most of us. <laughs> but uh, just before, so you learned Arabic one-on-one -on -one private, or did you go formally? No, I, I, I studied street? with him for three weeks. <laughs> three weeks. Yeah, and then he was teaching a crash course. Right. So I studied that with him for three weeks, and then he, he didn't have a book to teach from. He had this all in his head. So I was like, can you have a book? He goes, okay. Next day I came. He had, you know those print paper? He literally hand wrote uh, an 80-page book by hand and then photocopied it and stapled it and said, here's your book. Yeah. And <laughs> let me use that as a book. Amazing. And then I learned some basics of Nahu and Sarf and how they apply to the Quran. And then I started, um, so that was going on. I was like, I need to memorize this book. I need to understand more. I need to know more. And then it was so frustrating because the more I memorized every other word, I don't know what it means. Then there's another word I don't know. I don't, then I don't know. Then I don't know. Then I don't know, right? So I need to build this Arabic thing. This needs to happen. But I was going full-time to college, full-time to work. You know, my, my parents couldn't afford my tuition. And they had already gone back to Pakistan. So I'm living alone at this point, right? So... I was just doing all of these things just to, my, every, every extra bit of time I had was going into just either memorizing Quran or studying something in Arabic. And then he left, and that was a new problem. Now what do I do? Like, what do I learn now? Right? So I did, then I started, uh, because I, 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 it, it felt to me like if I don't make progress with the Quran, I'm going to regress what I've gained. Like, what I've gained spiritually, what I've gained philosophically the connection I've made, the whole connection is Qur'an. So I can't lose that, because if I lose Qur'an, I'll lose Allah. That's what I felt like. So it was this desperation to want to get more and more of this, right? So uh, I started taking the train to Astoria. Uh, it was an Arab neighborhood in Astoria. They have really good shawarmas, Lebanese. And uh, the imam, there was all, everybody speaks in Arabic there. So I just go and literally just... So Lebanese. Lebanese Sharma is pretty legit. You can speak Lebanese accent? No. Okay. Uh, then, you saved uh, yourself? No, I yeah. Was gonna, yeah no. So I'm Lebanese background, so I was okay, going to yeah. test you. Yeah, no, please don't. This is Hidayah, the meaning of Hidayah, isn't it? Yeah. Guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah khayran yufaqihu fi din Whether Allah wants goodness from them and sees goodness in them, He gives them the knowledge of the deen. Yeah. That's one area, mashallah. SubhanAllah. Yeah. So yeah, so I mean that's that's where the and eventually after 9/11, it was interesting uh, because New York. Obviously, I was in New York, and all of that mess happened in New York, and yeah, yeah. the Muslims were very particularly targeted, and mm. 
there was a journalist. I forget which. Even we copped it here. We had. I'm sure. You know, scarves being pulled off, uh, people being attacked in trams and stuff like that. Yeah. We had the authorities breaking down doors and all kinds of crazy you stuff. We were in the heart of it. Yeah, somehow. we're in the heart of it. Amazing. Tell us about it. Talk so, so when that happened, there was a journalist who heard me do a halaqa at my college. It was like a journalism student. So he applied. He asked his. Um, Editor, I forget which magazine it was. So a halaqa is a circle, Quran yeah, circle. Quran study circle. Used to have it in the in the college. college this four or five guys just right. get together. Got it. Yeah. You know. So he wanted to interview me. So I was like, okay, I'll interview you. So he interviewed me. This is like a two, three, three months after 9/11. And he's interviewing me. He's like, so don't you feel like you turn towards religion because you know some people they just need something to hook on to, like people hook on to drugs, other people hook on to paragliding. Oh, you hook. You we hear that all to. the time. Yeah. Right. And this, this, he was trying to really make sense of this thing in that way. I had the most fascinating conversation with him, and it made me realize, man, it's either Allah will attach you to his guidance, or there are so many useless things that you will absolutely be attached to until it's too late. Right? There's going to be stuff that you... There's too many magnetic things in this world that will just you know, pull you in, and you won't even know, and years will go by. Right? So um, that was a big part of, I think, uh, what helped me. Then the other thing that I think uh, helped me grow both spiritually and intellectually was um, an attitude that my teacher put in me, that I, I really benefited from, from that. He told me th that don't discriminate who you benefit from. Just benefit from everyone. Just learn. Grow and ask Allah for, keep asking Allah for guidance, but don't discriminate. And like, don't underestimate Allah's power to guide you and be scared. I shouldn't listen to this person because I might get misguided. I shouldn't listen to that person. No, no, no. If you're committed to Allah's book and you're committed to learning, Allah will guide you, but don't close doors. And that attitude led me to learn from ideologically opposite people in New York, because New York is very fragmented, like big cities are. You'll have masjids of a certain denomination, certain ideology, another masjid of the extreme opposite ideology, and the twain shall never meet. They might even describe each other as, you know, kuffar or bond. So you're talking you know, about the Muslim, Muslim community. Muslim community, okay. and even non-Muslims, actually. And non-Muslims. And non-Muslims. Okay. And I just, I, I opened that door of learning from any place. I'll learn. I'll, I'll consider everything. I'll listen to everything, and listen to it with an open heart. So, and, and, and what that did for my own Islamic studies was, I was, for example, I was uh, sitting in a halaqa and they were talking about, you know, the jama'at the, al-tabliq, the right? They call you to go in the path of Allah for this many days, this many days. I was like, okay, I can't comment on what they're doing until I experience it. So I went. That was the first group you joined? That was one of them. I was doing multitasking. Right. So <laughs> Why is that the same story with all of us? We started with tabliq too, you know, yeah. my, my father. And Allah reward them. Yeah. They did something pretty amazing. Yeah. Um, SubhanAllah. They, and then I, I went to a halaqa where they were teaching me how the people in tabligh are all misguided and their, their, their aqidah is bad. And, this, and then I was like, okay, I want to know why it's bad. So I sat and I studied aqidah with them for like a year. And then I went to another group. I don't want to name groups, but I went to another group who said, all of these people, they don't know what they're doing because they're not working to establish the khilafah. So why are they even wasting their time? So I was like, okay. Let me uh, find out how to establish the Khilafah with you guys. Let's, uh, so I just, and any group I joined, and then I went another group who said, all these people, they talk about, you know, uh, establishing the state, but they're not even, their heart's not even in the right state. And so they need to purify the state of their hearts. I was like, okay, let, let's figure out how to purify the state. Let, let, me, let me learn that. So I, got, so I, I did not discriminate in what I could take from And then what, what all of that did for me, it created a certain opinion, for better or for worse. That opinion was, everybody has a frame of reference, a lens by which they see the religion. Okay, they create this lens, and then they identify their entire view of Islam through that lens. Right? What's happened here, I think, I noticed that although you were listening to all those different groups, you weren't making a judgment immediately and you were reserving, acting upon certain things zealously or making that your belief or your way. You gave yourself some leeway, some space. Yeah, yeah. 
You didn't just attach yourself and go with it and say, These, they're the right people. I, I, I gave it a, f I wouldn't say I, I, I approached it with a grain of salt. I did give it like wholehearted, let me fully <clears throat> learn and immerse myself in what's being said without being combative or being skeptical. I really want to, I really want to know. And I really want to feel like I'm, I've embodied these ideas and then see, does this hold? And the thing that I kept feeling, this is the crazy thing, the thing that I kept feeling was, that feeling that I had when I heard the Qur'an in the masjid, I never felt that again. I never felt that. That feeling never came back. Interesting. What were you starting to feel? I was starting to feel that everybody is trying to impose an, a certain angle onto the religion. But if I put the Qur'an at the center, then it allows itself to shed light on every issue. Like it's like the, like the seerah, for example. I want to study the seerah, but I want to study the seerah in light of the Quran. I want to study the sunnah in light of the Quran. I want to study law in light of the Quran. I want to study aqidah in light of the Quran. Like it's not. So what what they were doing was what I felt was they were discussing a subject, and the Quran was a reference to the point they were trying to make. So it was just. A source of proofs and evidences for chapter one, two, three, and the points they want to make, right? But it wasn't the source; it was the supporting evidence, right? And there was a, it's a completely different experience when that's the source, and everything else is supporting evidence. Like that, that's your starting point. It's when I have a belief, but then I go and pick and choose which ayat will support my belief precisely and go with that whether it should be the opposite right, right. and then I noticed the, the more I discussed because I, I just want to I don't want to debate but I want to discuss mm. and it started making people really upset because I just wanted to discuss I said hey so you you cited this ayah but the ayah right after that and the one after that and the one after that and the one after that are yep. going exactly against what you just concluded exactly yeah. and yeah. then they're like Mm, yeah, no, we, we need, we need a, a senior brother to correct your misunderstanding. Oh, okay. Like, <laughs> so, like, so that I kept falling into that kind of issue, mm. right? So then I realized that I need to take the best of, and, I, and I, the thing is I didn't just see criticism, I see benefit in different groups and what they were doing. I saw a lot of benefit in each of them. But I saw this fundamental intellectual sort of gap, and that was that, the, the Book of Allah wasn't getting what it deserved. It felt to me like that. Because that first experience, the Book of Allah was at the center. Mm. Right? And then it was having an impact of a certain kind. And now it just it wasn't there. You know? And it wasn't even... I, I'll say frankly, it, it didn't feel to me intellectually convincing enough. It wasn't satiating enough. Because I'm coming from... I'm not coming from, hey, I just want to be a better Muslim. No, I want to I believe in something wholeheartedly almost like I'm accepting it all like anew, right? And that, that, that centrality of the Qur'an... Would it, you say that the spirituality started to fade away? Yeah. The spiritual side? Yeah, yeah. Felt a little bit of Absolutely. coldness or cloud. Yeah. Absolutely, mm -hmm. absolutely. Yeah. And yeah. That, that's something that I, I and think... With that, yeah. with that, because mashallah, you've studied the Qur'an very well, would that go in line with the ayah, وَلَا تَنَازَعُ فَتَفْشَلُوا or is it something else, do you think? I think it's kullu ah. hizbin It's, every, it's every, every group is really happy with what they have. Mm, okay. Right, that's what it's, it was more about preserving the identity of a group and of a certain way of thinking than it was about serving, you know, the, the like Allah. Mm. Even though the intention is to serve Allah, but the way to serve Allah is to preserve our you know, click. And then some of that became really ugly because then I would see how they speak of each other. And I was like, mm. here's a book that's saying, Adillatin ala al mu'minin, they're so humble and powerless before the believers that they have this brotherhood between them, love between them. And then you go to these different groups and they're like really spiteful and mm. cynical and mocking of the other. Mm. And I just, I don't see how we can believe this book and have this attitude. I don't, I, don't, I can't reconcile it, yeah. you know? So, um, but alhamdulillah, along the way I met how, some really, How did you solve that for yourself? I uh, kept an arm's length distance from too much affiliation. I kept, I, I mean, I benefited from a lot of different people. 
But I kept focused on my journey. I kept, I said, you know what? Uh, here's another perspective. A lot of people were learning Islam, but they were learning what makes the other person wrong. Like that's what the curriculum mostly entailed. Here are the evidences for why we're saying the right thing and why they're saying the wrong thing. So it's actually a reactive kind of curriculum. So as soon as you, you learned that lingo, you learned that language, you learned that approach. So as soon as you could hear someone take that approach, you thought, okay, I better move. Okay, you know what? Move or? So, so you're, you're teaching me why this and this is wrong, but I actually want to learn what Allah says. Not what they're saying wrong and what's actually the truth. I just want to, instead of correcting some wrong, I just want to learn the right without, with no regard for who's wrong, right? And that's a, it's a proactive learning, not a reactive learning. And that was, I just, I, it was really hard to find. It was really hard to find proactive learning. Uh, and that's when I decided to commit more and more to, you know what, I'll keep learning from all these places, but I'm going to fundamentally focus on my proactive learning of Allah's words themselves. I just really want to know what He's saying and continue to grow in that without passing judgment on anybody else. But I need to, I, whoever can help me with this, wherever I can get that help, I'll get it, I'll take it. You know? so the fundamentals are always there. There's no disagreement on the fundamentals of right. our deen, alhamdulillah. You're talking about the branches now. And that supports, I mean, there's the hadith of Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Khayrul I'll just say it in English so that we yeah. are English speakers. So uh, the best types of actions to Allah are the ones that are more consistent, even if they're small in number. If they're small in number, so yeah. So small quantity rather than a lot. Right. And you want to follow everything, you might go lost. So even if you have just a few things that are fundamental and strong, and especially the ones that are spiritual and, and, and uh, there's no disagreement on them. And you follow them and make them perfect them. Inshallah is better than having too much and branching off too much because... Yeah, and know, then, you know, know, the other thing is I can, be a, I can learn and continue to learn. Even you, you said I've studied a lot of Qur'an. I feel like I'm just starting with Qur'an studies. I'm so intimidated by the study of the Qur'an. Like, More let's, now than let's ever Let's come before. back now because before we get too complicated in, yeah. in the area. Let's come back to the Qur'an, yeah, Staz Norman. Okay. So you're saying that the more you study the Qur'an, to a lot of people, they aspire to be at the level that you're at. And they say, MashaAllah, and they listen to him at that level. He knows, and yet you're telling us, what are you telling us? You're telling us you still, you feel like you're in a deep ocean. You just don't know where you are still. I am, uh, I, know, I know some things I know about the Quran. I know many things that I'm yet to, yeah, I, mean, I mean, I know them very, at a very surface level. And, uh, and I know I need a lot of work. Like, I, I'm okay with saying that. I don't, you know, I'm never going to claim that I'm any kind of scholar or, you know, of the Quran, but I can say I'm a serious student. I can say that I am a serious student of the Quran, and whatever I do seriously study, I try to share. But there are tons of areas of Quranic studies, and the, just the Book of Allah, and then by extension of the Sirah and of the Sharia, everything that connects to Allah's Book, right? That just I approach it in a way that um, I'm not going to make any preconceived notions or assumptions that I understand it or I get it already. I'm going to come to it clean slate, assuming I know nothing, and bring, bring, Allah, bring all of my questions to Allah's door about this ayah. And bring all of my questions to Allah's door about this surah. And about this hadith. Like, I just need to know. Ya Allah, here's what I don't understand. You Do know? you mean you sit down and make dua to Allah? I make dua and I and document my questions. <laughs> tell, you know? me, tell us, Ustaz man. For the common person, yeah. how do you advise them to approach the Qur'an then? Because a lot of people don't know Arabic that well, right? Yeah. Of course, we have different uh, commentaries, interpretations of the meanings. Yeah. I mean, for me, Al-Mawdudi is one of the top five for me in the English world. Uh, maybe you differ on that, but... Uh, He's brilliant. Yeah, so you agree with me, don't you? Yeah, absolutely. Amazing, Al-Mawdudi. But how would you advise the common people to approach the Qur'an you know their level, you've been around, you understand the society and the community. Not all of them are Arabs and speaking Arabic. Yeah. What little pieces of advice you can give us to say, okay, when you come to approach the Qur'an, do you advise us to read it every day, even if we don't understand it? Do you advise us to learn the Arabic, even if we struggle with it? Do you advise us to read literally a little bit of commentary, even if it's a small surah or a small ayah every day? How, do you, how should we approach the Qur'an? I think... Um the approach that helped me, I have a hard time recommending another approach. 
because I tried the other approaches. I tried reading translation. I didn't, I didn't connect. And some people might. I'm, I'm not saying my experience has to be imposed on everybody else, but I know that after speaking to enough people, uh, the challenge with translation is understanding how the argument of the Qur'an is flowing, how, why is it repeating itself, why are the surahs in the order that they're in. There are too many literature-related questions that a standard book, you wouldn't have those questions, but you will absolutely have them with the Qur'an, and the translation will leave you kind of wanting. And then the, the, the commentaries that are available, short of uh, Abu Lalaam Madudi's uh, Tafimul Qur'an and Towards Understanding the Qur'an in English, which I think is brilliant, um, the commentaries are also so focused on the ayah and its meaning and its interpretation and opinions around that ayah mm -hmm. that you lose sight of your reading something that continuously flows. Because when you, you know, it's like when you're looking at an orchard and you're looking at a flower really zoomed in, you lose sight of the fact that this is part of a garden. You know, so my recommendation uh, is to actually, it's not for the individual, but it's actually for the communities and the imams and the du'at in the world. Right. And my recommendation for them is every Ramadan, they should be doing a dawra of the Qur'an, even if it's just Baqarah and just Ali Imran or just Nisa, but just a brief translation and explanation for their community. Every Ramadan, the community got a little more of the Qur'an that they got to understand. Okay. Right, and then what that would do, I think, is what that did for me at some level. So encouraging the community to basically to attach themselves to the community, to yeah. go to the masjid. Yeah, and I, I think the ideal listen, time to do that is Ramadan. Because that's where you're going to get it from. Yeah. And every day, read as much as you can. Read as much as uh, you can. I think reciting level. the Qur'an uh, connects the hearts to the Qur'an. Memorizing it connects the hearts to the Qur'an. No. It's one of its fundamental rights, whether you understand it or not. Not all of us understand everything in the Qur'an. But one word sometimes can stick, and at a time when you need it in your life, yeah. it comes to help you. Yeah. That's yeah. how the Quran is magnificent. One word. That's yeah. why it's so, two words. And one experience for me is, <clears throat> I've had many experiences like this, but one time when I was really desperately in need, where I was in deep, deep, deep grief and loss. And at that point, I can't think straight. And uh, I just can't think. So... Many different thoughts came to me, and subhanAllah, I don't know what the connection is with the subconscious mind, but when you're reciting the Qur'an every day uh, from a young age, when you really need it and you can't think, the verses come to you somehow. Mm. And for me, uh, but you've got to be regularly reading it, right, or reciting it. So, you know, certain verses came to me. I was in Lebanon, I heard the adhan in the uh, masjids being called, and this ayah came to me. I won't say which one, because it's... Alhamdulillah, people have heard my story, but uh, it's... I want to hear it. <laughs> it's online. You haven't heard but my story. But you're not, you're here right now. Just say the ayah, come okay. on. <laughs> well, <laughs> and you know the tragedy that I went through. My, yes. my, my son yeah. and brother, Alayhi they passed away. And may Allah have mercy on all those <laughs> families who have had members of their family pass away. And it's nothing like our brothers and sisters in Gaza at the moment, everywhere around the world. But when they passed away, obviously the grief hit me very, very strongly in Lebanon. And I didn't want to see anybody. I didn't want to be with anybody. Nobody could give me any words of solace that could help me. I just yeah. felt everybody's fake. Everybody's not, no one's really just saying words like a parrot. Yeah. So uh, there came a point where I just needed some help, right? I'm about to um, just, I, I can't handle it. So, you know, the ayat that came to me were things like, وَلَا تَقْتُلُوا أَنفُسَكُمْ إِنَّهُ كَانَ بِكُمْ رَحِيمًا You know, you know, uh, uh, many different, but uh, yeah. do not kill yourselves, do not overburden yourselves, do not, you know, do that to yourselves. Allah is ever so merciful to you. Yeah. And these little verses to me meant tremendous meanings. It's not, and I've read them, recited them maybe thousands of times wow. in my life. And then what duha suddenly had a different meaning altogether. We've been reciting it thousands of times, but this time it was different. Inna ma'al usri yusra suddenly has a different meaning. Wow. Those same verses that you recite every day. And suddenly they just have a different effect. It just the Quran hits you from different corners of your inner body. Yeah. <clears throat> Many others, Surat Yusuf, for example, had a tremendous effect 
on myself. And I kept reciting it over and over again. But this time, when you, you don't need a scholar to teach you or a sheikh. Your, your own. I had many, I've got, still got many teachers that I refer to, but I didn't need them anymore at this point. At this point, the Quran is reading me and giving me the medicine that I need. Fihi shifa'un linnas, as Allah says. In it is a cure for people. Uh, and I don't know, the, the, the Quran has that relationship with everybody. Yes. Even if you don't understand that all those few verses, those few surahs that everybody's memorized in time of calamity, in time of need, in time of uh, blessings, in time of... They come to you. But I found that you have to be reciting and being with it on a daily basis, even if it's 10 minutes or 15 minutes. That's right. Yeah. Do, you, can you, do you agree with that? I absolutely agree with that. And I think it's a lifeline for the believer. I don't think that... Um, it's, it's too easy for the Qur'an to become an artificial relationship. Exactly. It's, it's far too easy. Yes. And in fact, for people that are knowledgeable somewhat in the Qur'an, it's even more easy for it to become artificial. Because there's a, there's a knowledge-based and study-based and contemplation-based kind of relationship with the Qur'an. But the recitation of the Qur'an and just the, the heart reading the Qur'an, not the mind reading the Qur'an, is a different thing. That's it's it's an entity by itself. You can recite it with your heart. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Live yeah. with it. Tabarakallah. Mm. There's so much to talk about with you. So much, subhanAllah. I really, you're becoming more and more interesting, mashallah. Yeah, I talk a lot, I know. I'll, no, <laughs> alhamdulillah, I do too. Ben. Um, <clears throat> uh, yeah, Ustaz Norman, do you have teachers at the moment that you refer to still? You have your scholars and teachers, alhamdulillah. And do you recommend that people try and find someone who is older and more knowledgeable, who they can refer to as Absolutely. well? Absolutely. I think everybody should have a not mentor to, and a Not to and be self-taught, for example. Yeah, I think, I think learning Islam is a combination of learning yourself and always having someone senior that you can refer to. Because the two extremes are, they're going to do all the heavy lifting for you, or you're just going to do everything by yourself. No. But I, what I do believe in is you should be exploring and studying and learning your religion. And every time you arrive, what you think you arrive at certain conclusions, there should be people in your life, scholars, mentors, elders, imams, whoever you can go to and say, hey, this is what I'm arriving at. Am I, am I right or wrong? And that's in addition to, that's your own personal pathway. But if there are, you know, courses, programs, you know, uh, set pathways that you can take that you can help you educate yourself, I think one should take advantage of those things. What's your favorite surah right now? Taghabun. At Taghabun. <laughs> Why? <laughs> hands down. Uh, hands down. Hands down. Hands down. Yeah. It's because um, Taghabun talks about pretty intense stuff, battles and things. Taghabun talks about the battle inside, and uh, Taghabun actually, to me, I think has probably, uh, to me, the most powerful ayah. Mm, pertaining to one's personal journey in life, وَمَنْ يُؤْمِنْ بِاللَّهِ يَهْدِي قَلْبَهُ is uh, to, I find that phrase to be so overwhelming in English. Uh, who, whoever, the way I'd like to translate that is whoever may hold on to their faith, whoever were to hold on to their faith, Allah will guide their heart. Um, that statement and the way that it occurred in that ayah to me represents uh, probably the most invaluable treasure in the world. You know? Because there's not a soul that's not going to go through musibah. Exactly. And right? share throughout so all people, knowledgeable not a, or not. Yeah. Mm. Not, there's not one of us that's not going to go through some kind of trial. And Allah is saying, maybe the, maybe the reason you're going through this loss is because I want to give you a gain that's more than any other gain you could ever have. And that's Yahdi Qalbahu. You, you know, guide your heart. Like, guide your heart. It's the heart that we want to be yeah. guided, isn't it? Once the heart right. is guided, the rest, inshallah, follows. The rest. I've even been seeing on social media people have never heard about Islam just right now being introduced to the Quran for the first time. And they're blown away. They're blown, blown away. away. And they take one verse of the Quran and they see it in a light that I know a lot of Muslims haven't explored that yet. Yeah. <laughs> and then they bring it to you because they, they've opened up. They're looking at their circumstances and they're living with it. And they say, wow. This Qur'an is truly, truly reading me and talking to me. It's, it's taking it right out of my heart and out of my brain and telling you, here it is, face it, it's right in front of you, yeah. face. Look at it, whether you like it or not. Look at it. Yeah, yeah. Subhanallah. subhanAllah. Isn't that true? Such a mirror. 
Mm -hmm. You know, you know when you said just we're almost going to wrap it up. Yeah. But you know when you said about how you were raised in, with uh, your mother sewing. Yeah. What did she sew for you? Your a sweater. Your sweater. Yep. Was it a nice sweater? No. Sorry, mom. No brand name. It was a it was a it was a V neck with three buttons. Yeah. <laughs> It's the most beautiful thing in the world, isn't it? It's so, an act of love. It's that's an what makes it beautiful. <laughs> it's the intention. Because you know, people know my story about the Adidas. You know, the three stripes. Do you ever uh -huh. heard of the three stripes? You know, yeah, when they yeah, first yeah. came out. You, you're probably nearly my age. So, when when Adidas first came out, I was in year seven. I was teased because um, I never had Adidas. Right? My mother was sewed my <laughs> tracksuit pants. And uh, yeah, that's so cool. <laughs> it's so cool. I was a weirdo, man. I was a nerd. I was bullied. And then um, uh, I got sick, and then my, and then I got a present. And that present was a whole outfit of Adidas with the three stripes. If you had one stripe, you're doomed. If you had two stripes, you're doomed. If you had, you know, I mean, one time I, I did get a gift from some Lebanese cousins, and it was Adidas. <laughs> one of those. <laughs> so I wore it and I got bullied more, right? <laughs> but the day when I got those three stripes, I became the coolest, one of the coolest kids in all that week. Are you serious? Well, like, wow. because it's so superficial. It's all about brands and what you look like and on the outside. So much so that some students used to go around the corner and steal from shops just to fit in. That peer pressure is tremendous. And the Quran takes you away from all of that and just puts you in another world and say, don't worry. Yeah, it's, it's, all that You're bigger petty. than that. Yeah. You're bigger than that, subhanAllah. Yeah, subhanallah. May Allah reward you, Staz no, man. It was tremendously, um, I, I appreciate and loved this interview. This is my first podcast I've ever done with anybody, personally. You were the first. I appreciate and, that a lot. And uh, so, barakallahu okay. fikum. Jazakallahu khair, Staz. And thank you for being our guest here in Australia. Thank you. In Melbourne. Hope you're enjoying oh, I yourself. I don't feel like a guest. I feel like I'm a home. Alhamdulillah. So, alhamdulillah. And that's what we want you to feel right. like. So, our own brother. Come here, man. Give me Take a kiss. Yeah. Do, you, do you do kisses in Afghanistan? No, Pakistan? No, we don't do kisses in Pakistan. Well, that's we, we, do, we do salam alaikum, goodbye. Yeah, well, that's a Lebanese thing. You just got a kiss from whether you like it or not. All right. Jazakallahu khair. Thank you.